Uh, welcome to the learning theory section. Um, so the first three talks will actually be given by the same um, author, Zewan Alan Zou from Princeton University. And uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks for attending and thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is the first one. It's a joint work with Yang Yuan from Canara University. Um, work. Okay. So everyone knows gradient descent. So gradient descent is to go in the direction of the gradient iteratively in order to minimize the objective value. And everyone else knows stochastic gradient descent, which is to, instead of going in the full gradient direction, which may take so long time to compute, but going in the direction of a random gradient, known as stochastic gradient. Uh, like here, 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 uh, hoping that uh, maybe the expected value of the stochastic gradient equal to the full gradient. Okay. Uh, and natural such choice is when the function is of the finite sum form, of finite average form, when the function is uh, finite average of the fi's. In such a case, you can define the stochastic gradient just to be the gradient of a random one of them, and the data is known as SGD, stochastic gradient descent. So SGD is famously known for its slow convergence. Uh, although each of its iteration is actually n times cheaper to compute uh, than the full gradient, but the SGD converges slowly, and one of the main reasons behind that is because the variance of the stochastic gradient is actually very large. So the way to fix this uh, is the so-called variance reduction technique. It has various different forms resulting in like, tons of different methods. And among them, like one of my favorites is the so-called SBRG method. It does the following. It focuses on uh, there's still the finite sum form of the functions, but assuming that each fi to be convex and smooth. So here, the smoothness, smoothness is with respect to some parameter L. So here is how SVRG works. It iteratively perform updates of the form xk to go to xk plus 1 in the direction of the so-called gradient estimator to be defined promptly with the learning rate eta. Okay. So here is the specific way that SBRG defines this gradient estimator. Uh, it divides the algorithm into epochs, each epoch of length m, which is roughly 2m both in theory and in practice. And then at the very beginning of each epoch, let's say here, here, and here, it defines x theta to be this point and call it a snapshot. Whenever the algorithm is at the snapshot point, it computes the full gradient exactly. So this takes a long time to compute, but don't worry, it's only computed very rarely, like only once in a while. And then in each of the follow-up iterations, SDRG defines the gradient estimator to be this quantity, which is a very quick fix to the full gradient of the most recent snapshot, which was already computed, and we can just store that in the memory, which is very efficient. And then you perform some fix with respect to a random coordinate i, a random function i. So this estimator is very good. First, it's an unbiased estimator to the full gradient of the function. And more importantly, one can actually show that <coughs> the variance of this unbiased estimator actually approaches to zero when we are minimizing the function as we continue the procedure. So this is the high-level algorithmic and the technical kind of quick summary about SDRG. So in terms of the convergence rate, in the original paper of SDRG, they proved that if the function f is strongly convex with parameter sigma, then here is the convergence rate. It converges in this number of iterations, okay, which is known to be faster than gradient descent and faster to SGD. So to sum up, uh, that's SVRG. So it, uh, it's a very nice method that improves both gradient descent and SGD. So in this paper, we opened up the box of SVRG to provide uh, convergence theorems that the original SVRG method cannot achieve. Uh, in particular, as I mentioned, the original SVRG method requires the function to be strongly convex and requires each fi to be convex. So in the first result, uh, we relax the first assumption, that is, we focus on functions that are still convex, but not strongly convex. 
This includes many important examples like lasso and logistic regression. Okay, that's the first result I will present. Uh, the second result uh, focuses on what if each fi is not convex, although the average of the function is still convex. So this problem, this class of problems, also has a lot of important applications. And this framework was first proposed by Shashel Schwartz, and he presented this paper actually in the first session of this FML. And what we did in this paper is here. That is, we provide even improved analysis upon this. So that's our second theorem. And we have a third theorem to combine both, but uh, that I will skip for today. So this is the high-level overview of the first part I'll be given. So a quick advertisement, uh, if you want to stay a bit longer, uh, that's the second part. I will talk about what if we move everything to the non-convex world, totally non-convex world. In the third part, I will talk about what if we start to work in the dual. In such a case, coordinate sorry, various reduction becomes coordinate descent, and we can further do acceleration on top of that. So let's now go to the first half of the first part. That is, what if the function is not strongly convex? More formally, uh, we focus on minimizing composite functions of the form f plus psi, where psi could be an easy proxima function, such as the L1 regularizer. And the interesting part is the f part, that's a finite average of the fi. So lasso definitely fits into this one more, and the logistic regression as well. In general, nearly all L1 regularized ERM problems follow here, uh, to fit, fit into this framework. And as I mentioned earlier, SBRG, at least their original theorem and the follow work, uh, does not solve this problem directly. And here's what people do in practice. There are two known approaches. Approach one, to perturb the function a little bit by introducing an L2 regularizer. Now the function becomes strongly convex, and you can use SBRG to solve it, and uh, that provides an indirect solution to the original non strongly convex function. So if you set the parameters to be right, then this is the theoretical running time that you will get. So unfortunately, this indirect method is not very pleasant in practice for various reasons. So people say that first, you need some extra parameter tuning. And two, more importantly, because you're changing the problem, then remember, L1 regularized the problems are having sparse solutions. That's one of the very important features we want. But the, the solution of this one is not necessarily very sparse. So for this reason, uh, people also start to de uh, derive direct methods, like Saga, to directly solve this not strongly convex objective. And this is the number of iterations they provide. Kind of comparable to the first one. Uh, what we showed in the paper is that not only SBRG directly works, but something even more interesting happens. That is, we can actually make two modifications to SBRG. That's what we call it as. SBRG plus plus, one plus for multiplication, uh, we can provide a slightly different method that provi uh, provides an even faster running time. Okay. So that is the theoretical uh, description of our first result. So let's now see like what are the two modifications that we make. Remember, this is how SBRG looks like. It divides the algorithm into epochs. Our first modification is to change the epoch Schedules. That is, we make the epoch length to actually double between iterations. That's the first change. The second change is that uh, instead of defining the snapshot to be the first point of the epoch, we define it to be the average, uniform average, of the most recent epoch itself, uh, of the most recent encode epoch. While at the same time, we do not break the flow of the algorithm. We don't restart an epoch from the snapshot, but we continue here. So across epochs, we still go from the last point of the previous epoch to the next point of the new epoch. So we do not break the flow. So these technical changes, very technical, but they turn out to be really necessary, at least in our analysis, to provide not only the fastest theoretical running time, but even the fast up to constant uh, convergence rates. So, they turned out to be very helpful to provide this final convergence result, which I will skip the details here. Not very hard to prove. And it not only works in practice, uh, in theory, but also in practice. Okay. So this is 
the first result. Uh, the second result that I will mention today is what if each fi is not convex? Formally, it's this problem, and we are doing that each function fi is non convex but smooth. Okay? So here is at least one important application to this class of problems that is the so called matrix shift and invert problem. That has now become the central problem used in all versions of the state of the art stochastic PCA, SVD, CCA, and so on and so forth. So it's, believe me, it's a very important problem. And in this problem, each fi is of the form this. So here, ai is a feature vector. You compute the inner product, but you subtract it from the objective. In this way, the function fi is no longer complex. If you compute the Hessian, then all the eigenvalues have their absolute values bounded by one. And therefore, the function fi is one smooth, but non complex so this is one example. And uh, assuming for simplicity in this talk that the function being strongly convex, then this is what the prior work proved. So Shinshaw Schwartz proved in you know, a very nice paper that uh, if you use the same SVRG method, no change, then here is the convergence rate. This is the number of iterations for SVRG to convert to an epsilon minimizer of the functions. So you see like we have the condition number 12 sitting here. Okay. So this is what we do in this paper. We are interested in a more general and more challenging class of functions, which is each S phi being L upper smooth and a little L lower smooth, meaning that all the eigenvalues of the function, of the Hessian of the function, are between minus L and big L. So we break the symmetry here and provide a convergence theorem in terms of this more refined definition of the non-convexity and the smoothness. So this is what we proved. So I will read this convergence theorem with you in two ways. First by an example and second by a plot. By example. So here, if you take a closer look at this problem and the context around it, then you will see that the eigenvalues of this Hessian are actually not symmetric. They are between minus one and some parameter lambda which could uh, very likely be less than one, something that could even be one over d, or d is the dimension of the problem, whatever that means. So it could be something very small. And if you plot this thing to our theorem, uh, you get lambda over sigma squared, but the, in the prior work, you get one over sigma squared. So that's a speed up factor of lambda that could be very small. So that's by example. And the more interesting way to view our new convergence theorem is to look at the following plot. So suppose we plot the number of iterations in terms of this lower smoothness parameter, little l, then this is what we get. If we fix the big l and change the little l. Now, uh, remember that all the eigenvalues of the Hessian are in this range. So the first observation is that if we have a little bit of non-convexity, meaning the eigenvalues could be less than zero, but still very close to zero. In such a case, we have a plateau. So claim, SVRG now converges as fast as if each fi is convex in this plateau. And the reason is because of this max. Okay, that's the first observation. And more interestingly, like when we start to like relax the lower smoothness parameter, meaning that we make the function more and more non-convex, then the convergence rate becomes linearly dependent on this parameter L. And in comparison to the prior work, uh, this is what that theorem says. So it's not only higher here, but it's a quadratic dependence on the L. So that is to compile our result with the prior work in a plot. So uh, that's actually it. And uh, that concludes the first part. Thanks. So that its expectation had better equal to the full gradient. And it could be n times 
faster to compute at the stochastic gradient because if the function is of the final sum form, then yes, it then comes cheaper. That's a repetition of the first part. Now comes something different. That is, in the second part, I want to focus on the totally non-convex problem. That is, I do not assume any uh, convexity. So the whole function fx and each individual function fi could be non-convex. OK? So let's first see some applications. So the so-called non-convex empirical risk minimization problems fall into this category, meaning that whenever you have some loss function plus some regularizer, if the loss function is no longer convex, mm -hmm. such as 0, 1 loss or sigmoid loss, now this classification problem just becomes a non-convex ERM problem. And that falls into this category. That's example one. And later, we will actually see uh, experiment, and it's really because the non-convex loss functions are really more preferable in practice in terms of the generalization error, and that makes these problems even more interesting than convex DRM problems. Okay, that's example one. We will go back to that later. We will go back to that later. So example two, training neural nets. Now everyone is talking about that. So suppose each, uh, suppose we denote the weight factor of the neural nets by vector x, then one can write down the loss function with respect to one sample as a function of fi. Now, training neural network is equivalent to minimizing an objective like this, which is again non convex Okay, these are two basic examples that fall into this category. So, what are the known theoretical results? I claim among the class of first order optimization, there are only two known results. One is gradient descent, the other one is stochastic gradient descent. So assume here that uh, both of the results are doing some smoothness. So suppose the function fi, each fi is smooth with parameter l, then this is how gradient descent converges. In this number of iterations, gradient descent provides an output whose norm of the gradient is no more than epsilon. So, this is different from obtaining the global minimizer. In plus, it means that I can find a point whose gradient is very, very close to flat. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here. But of course, in theory, I cannot prove that uh, we converge to global minimizers because that's an anti hard problem to do. But in practice, people do lots of heuristics, like you find random starting points, random seeds, or simulated annealing kind of techniques. And, uh, but I will leave that to a different work. And this work, we only focus on um, starting from an arbitrary point. How can we get a point whose norm of the gradient is small? This is known as first order optimization for non convex problems. The gradient descent converges in this number of iterations, and the SGD converges in this number of iterations with a 1 over square convergence rate. So here, the variance is the variance of the stochastic gradient. So those two results are not very hard to prove. Uh, so there, I cannot even trace back to the first person who proved it, so they're essentially both wrong. So for those of you who have worked a lot on convex optimization, so these two theoretical bounds definitely ring some bell because they look completely the same as the convex case. Remember in the convex case, we want to find a point that's epsilon close to the unique minimizer. And over there, that was the convergence rate for GD and SGD. They look almost exactly identical if you look at the blue part. Okay. That is very good for. So uh, a quick remark, whenever we talk about greater descent, actually you have better multiply the number of iterations by a factor of n, just because full gradient descent has uh, computes the full gradient, which is n times lower to compute than the stochastic gradient descent. And therefore, in terms of the so-called ISO cores, number of like incremental function core, oracle cores, then this is the fair way to compile GD and SGD. So multiply this way n, uh, by n. So now if you summarize everything, in both convex and non-convex words, we have convergence rates for GD and SGD. In the first part, you definitely have heard about me saying SDRG works better than gradient descent and SGD. And this is the number of iterations up to a log factor that it achieves for this class of functions. Okay. In this paper, uh, this is our result. So we provide the first 
theoretical improvement uh, that works better than gradient descent and SGD in the non-convex world. Okay, that's how we read that. So the first observation that you see from the picture is that we don't get exactly this conversion. We get something that's weaker. So this is for a reason, because non-convex problems are much, much harder to study. And I personally believe that this n to the two-thirds factor is tight for the SBR genome state. Okay? But at the same time, it's one of the absolute convergence, so better than this. And at the same time, it's at least a factor n to the one-third factor uh, faster than full gradient descent. So I think it's quite a significant result, especially knowing that there was literally no theoretical result before this uh, after GD and SGD. So now uh, let me dial a little bit into the into the details. So remember, this is how SBRG methods look like. This is the repetition from the first part. That is, uh, SBRG iteratively performs a phase of this form. That is, it goes from xk to xk plus one with a learning rate times a gradient estimator. And the way it defines the gradient estimator is by dividing the algorithm into epochs, each epoch of length, say, roughly 2n. And then uh, it, defines this, it defines the so-called snapshot point to be the first point of the epoch. And whenever it's a, a snapshot, it computes the full gradient exactly. Okay? And e, in each of the follow-up iterations, it defines the gradient estimator to be this quantity, which is a faster compute quantity, and uh, its expectation is the same as the true gradient and its variance approaches to zero in the convex case. So that was the second quick recap of SBRG. Okay. So let's now see what will happen in the non-convex world. So to summarize SBRG, then the key level of SBRG in the convex case is this. Okay, it's used in nearly all the versions of proof of SBRG, including the SBRG plus plus in the first one. That is, the variance of the gradient estimator, uh, actually, if you take the expectation, is no larger than this quantity in the convex case. Meaning that if you start to approach to the optimizer, to the unique minimizer of the function, then this quantity becomes close to zero, and this also becomes close to zero. And that's why people always say that variance reduction <coughs> provides a gradient estimator whose variance approaches to zero. That was the key idea behind it. And let's now see what will happen in the non-convex world. Okay. A quick summary, one line, that is everything will go wrong. In particular, even if you can prove a variance upper bound of this form, by the way, this inequality is no longer true, but even if it were true, okay, then in non-convex optimization, we cannot hope to get to the global minimizer. And therefore, this quantity does not approach Okay? And therefore, we have to take a fundamentally different approach, although for the same algorithm. So the lemma that we used is this simple one, one line to prove, already proved here. That says the variance of the gradient estimator is upper bounded by a constant time how much we have moved away from the most recent snapshot. Okay? So this is not hard to prove, but let's, from a very high level, try to understand how we can use this. So suppose that was the most the recent snapshot. We keep moving, 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 moving. And then we arrive at the point which is not far away, not too far away from the most recent snapshot. In such a case, I claim that we have a good upper bound on the variance, and believe me, then the rest of the proof will be simple. This is actually a good case. Okay? We don't have large variance. The opposite case is what if we have moved actually quite a lot, and we are now quite far away from the most recent snapshot. But if you think about it, in this time, we don't have a good variance upper bound, but why have we moved so far? Okay? It's really because of, uh, in a statistical sense, all of those gradient directions or gradient estimated directions roughly lie in the same direction. Okay? That means in those iterations, we have already followed, in some sense, the gradient direction and therefore decreased the objective already by some amount. Okay? 
So this is kind of the high level idea for the second case, and therefore the final convergence, the final analysis would look like a very delicate balance between the two worlds. Okay, that's the very high level idea. And in case you're a little bit interested in how the proof structure looks like, uh, here's what we did. We used this Ferenc lemma, and uh, we used the linear coupling framework I have been advocating for already two years now, which is to analyze first order method by combining gradient descent and mirror descent, and then we provided like a non convex version of the gradient descent and mirror descent that looks like something like this. Uh, this is the slide we're supposed to get lost, but it's how the proof looks like. We provide some gradient and mirror descent lemma. Then we provide some uh, very interesting telescoping schemes that says that in each epoch, we had better decompose the epoch into sub-epochs for analysis purpose only, and then we try to do telescoping within each sub-epoch, and then you get good things, some good terms canceled out, and that's how the proof roughly looks like. So not very simple, but we do have a one-page sketch proof in the paper. Very encouraged to read that. So this is in sum uh, how in the proof, how in the theory that we obtain this result. But let's now see some experiments. The first experiment uh, is very exciting to me. Uh, that is the uh, non-convex classification problem. That is, we run the same algorithm as DRG with respect to different log functions. Some non-convex logs, like sigmoid, as, and compile that to all the like classically used convex log functions, like hinge log, logistic, or square log, and see how the performance looks like. The solid curve is our uh, is SDRG but some non convex logs. The first claim I want to make is that, well, SDRG still works very good on convex log functions as compared to non, uh, um, non convex function, uh, log functions as compared to convex logs. And therefore, you know, in practice, you can directly apply SDRG on that. But more importantly, look at the next two plots. If we randomly flip one eighth or one fourth, of the training data labels, meaning we introduce noise, like noisy data like this, then suddenly, like non-convex log functions become really, really great because actually, in theory, they generalize much better. So think about this. If I have a noisy data like this, then if you use a convex log function like hinge logs, then you have to go here and pay a really large penalty factor. This is like me attending this SML. I shouldn't pay three red fees. I should pay maybe only one. You should penalize me only once. But this is the place actually one can use non convex log functions to solve it. Using like a six point loss or a zero one loss, you only get this point penalized by one in this direction. And that's why uh, we say that non convex log functions generalize better in uh, noisy data. And that's also why all the other convex log functions really start to perform very bad. So that's example one. Uh, example two is a plot example. So we trained neural nets um, of two layered small scale neural network, uh, only one hidden layer. So we compiled XGB and Amagrad, which are two different versions of XGB, which are the dotted red and dotted the blue ones, compiled to four different options of SDRG like this four and this four. So we see some uh, practical performance of SDRG to SGD based method. But we definitely view this as only a very preliminary result because we're only running that on a very quiet example, like two layers neural net. But we do have provided some uh, empirical suggestions about uh, how you should uh, use SDRG. So by providing different options, for instance, we recommended the uh, to use adaptive learning rate of SVRG uh, as opposed to constant learning rate, then it performs a bit better, and so on and so forth. We have some detailed explanations about what the four options are. So I really hope that uh, there could be some follow-up work to do this more seriously on some large-scale journey. So that's it. Thank you. That's the second part.
uh, but it's the third part. So <laughs> this is the ground force with Peter Rich Parry, Jim Chu, and Yang Yuan. So everyone knows gradient descent. Okay. Like this. So this time, I will not talk about stochastic gradient descent. I will talk about something else that is randomized coordinate descent. That is, instead of going the full, uh, in the direction of the full gradient, but I go in the direction of a coordinate gradient, which is instead of computing the full gradient vector, which could be very long, I compute only one coordinate of that, which is nearly n times cheaper to compute in many applications. Uh, which pictorially means that I go either in this direction or that direction in a two-dimensional space. And if I randomly choose a coordinate to go in each direction, uh, in each iteration, then this is known as coordinate descent. So a quick disclaimer, coordinate descent is very different from stochastic gradient descent. Although one can reduce actually one to the other, that is one can reduce coordinate descent to SGD and use that SGD method to solve coordinate descent, but I guarantee you that in this way, you're losing some information. You don't get a good convergence result, at least in theory. And therefore, coordinate descent really deserves its own path of research. All right. Uh, here are the known results for coordinate descent. In this part, to be simple, I will only focus on strongly convex functions. So I assume the function f is strongly convex, and all the eigenvalues are larger than or equal to the sigma. Now, uh, here is the quick summary about gradient descent and coordinate descent. In gradient descent, People typically assume that the function being smooth, meaning all the eigenvalues of the Hessian are no larger than L, and parameter L, then this is the number of iterations that gradient descent converges. Okay, that's uh, quite a folklore result. And uh, in the coordinate case, one can assume actually something much weaker. That is <coughs> that all of the diagonal entries of the Hessian are upper bounded by some parameter LC. So this is the number of iterations you can prove for coordinate descent. So two quick remarks. Remark one, this coordinate smoothness parameter is definitely less than or equal to the full gradient smoothness. That's why I said it's a weaker assumption. Uh, one can compute that actually it's not only smaller, but it could be up to a factor n smaller. Okay, that's a basic fact of matrix. Uh, remark two, just like gradient descent versus SGD, when comparing gradient descent with coordinate descent, we should also multiply this with n for a fair comparison in terms of the running time. Okay? So with that in mind, uh, coordinate descent can be up to a factor n faster. It's never slower than gradient descent, but it could be up to a factor of n faster. So these are like folklore results. Now let's translate to something a bit more complicated. That's acceleration. So accelerated gradient descent uh, using Nastro's momentum idea can help you to improve the running time to be square root in terms of the number of iterations. And one can do the same thing in the coordinate, uh, in the coordinate descent world. And uh, again, that's always faster than accelerated gradient descent and up to a factor you can. So these are known results. Mm -hmm. So in this part, uh, and in this work, we focused on a more challenging case. That is, what if the coordinate smoothness of the functions are actually non-uniform? Meaning that we have a different upper bound on each of the diagonal entries of the Hessian, which has which arises very naturally from real life applications. We will see that on the next slide. So in this more challenging case, people have already studied what will happen. Both in the non-uniform, uh, both in the coordinate descent case and in the accelerated coordinate descent case, and here is what they got. At a very high level, it's very simple to see how this theorem, why they roughly make sense. Just replace the maximum upper bound, the LC, with the average. You replace it with the average here. You replace it with the average here, and this is what you get. Okay. So these kind of results are, in my mind, not very hard to prove, uh, although still requires a few lines, but uh, they are the most natural thing that people can design. So Nastro proved here, and the and Sisbor proved here. So for at least two years, even some of the original authors believe that this line of research is done, because everything is proved. Okay. 
So what we found out from this paper is that actually there is one perhaps last thing to do. That is, you can provide, we run out of names, we can, we have to use the word even faster, accelerate the quality of that. That is, we obtain the running time of this one with the numerator being the summation of the square root of the smoothness parameters. So this could be, again, a factor written faster than the state of the art, for instance, because if, say, all of the Li's are, uh, except one of the Li's that is large, but the rest are very close to zero, in such a case, we get only one square root, but the other one gets, like say, square root n times that factor. So we obtained an even faster accelerated conversion rate. So that is, from a high level, uh, what our con contribution is. Okay. Uh, now let me quickly mention some applications. That is why this non-uniform case is interesting. So example one, uh, again, the year end problems, uh, the, the, say the causal division problems like less so and so on and so forth, if you write the final objective down, then this is roughly you will see a regularizer and some loss function. So if you convert this very carefully to the real problem, okay, not very trivial, but if you do that very properly, you're guaranteed that the dual objective is coordinate smooth. And what is the smoothness is proportional, roughly, to the norm of the i feature vector as well. Okay? Now think about it in many of the data sets, especially NLP data sets, you don't have the feature vectors to be of the same form, uh, of, of the same norm. And whenever that happens, then you could expect non-uniform coordinate sets to further improve the running time. And in this board, the best known result was called that APCG, and we provide even faster running time. That's the example one. So example two, matrix inversion. So suppose we have a positive, positive definite matrix A that we want to invert. So this problem is equivalent to minimizing the following quadratic convex function, okay, for almost obvious reasons. And if you look at this objective, the coordinate smoothness are, with respectfully, with are the i coordinate has a smoothness that's the i plasma entry of the matrix. Okay, that's a simple graph. And of course, when we are inverting a matrix, very likely the diagonal entries are not really uniform. And this is why a non-uniform coordinate descent could again like help to improve the running time. And in this case. All those like optimization methods also have their like numerical analysis names. For instance, gradient descent is equivalent to the supporting inverse power method, and so on and so forth. And we provide even faster running time. That's again up to a factor of ten faster. So that is application two. Okay. So now let me quickly uh, point out how our theory roughly looks like. So I will go in this direction. So instead of directly jumping to the final thing, I would go from something that's very easy. I will start with uh, gradient descent. Okay, so I find that the, the convergence rate of gradient descent can be proved using this following uh, simple line. That's a consequence of smoothness, meaning that if I move from a point x k to x k plus one in the direction of the gradient with a step length one over l, then I can guarantee to decrease the objective value in this step. And here is how much I can decrease. Okay, so this is not very hard to prove. And uh, it's a full core somehow that one can turn this lemma into that conversion rate. Okay, this I will not do in detail. And this is gradient descent. Let's now move to coordinate descent. I claim that I only need one line to <coughs> That is, uh, if you switch this lemma into the coordinate descent phase, all your changes to replace the full gradient with the coordinate gradient, okay, single change. And now if you take expectation on both sides, you get something whose, num whose denominator is n times LP as compared to L, okay? Now I can go down. You just replace the L here with the n times LC, and that's how you get the conversion rate for coordinate descent. One line, okay? Let's now transfer to the more challenging word that's accelerated coordinate descent. So people can prove that in different ways. And my favorite way is to use, again, the linear copying framework that I have been advocating for a while. That is to analyze 
should design and analyze accelerated methods using linear coupling of gradient and mirror descent. So without really saying in details what they are, because they are in prior work, I just want to point out that the gradient and gradient descent and mirror descent lemma roughly looks like this. Okay. So again, in order to know how this is proved, only one thing important. When you linearly combine the two inclusions, you see this by cancelling out this term. So you have a factor that's n squared times L C. Okay. Then again, believe me, using some prior knowledge, prior work's knowledge, whenever you have a factor, whatever that's the factor sitting here, then you can take the score root and put it, you can take a score root and then put it into the final convergence. And that's the wrong one you will get. Okay? So this kind of proof technique is already in the prior work. So now comes our observation. That is, we want to study what will happen if things become non-uniform. The same dilemma is from the previous slide. But if the coordinates have some non-uniformity, then let's try to treat the coordinates non-uniformly. Each coordinate i with probability pi. If you do it that way, uh, this is what will change, and this is what will change here. And again, if you do the linear coupling of the two, this time you get this parameter instead of what was on the previous one. So now, if you stare at this for like 10 seconds, there's an immediate choice of what pi should be. That is, we should choose the probability to pick a coordinate i with a probability proportional to the square root of the smoothness. Okay? Now, if you do it that way, uh, this quantity becomes the summation of the square root and square. As I promised, using some prior work's results, you can take the square root here and put it into the final convergence. And this is, at a very high level, how we obtain our convergence rate. Okay? So, if you ask me, like, why maybe prior results did not obtain this, uh, I have two reasons. One is because some of them uh, kind of reduced the problem of non uniform coordinate descent to uniform coordinate descent by scaling. So, this reduction, unfortunately, is not high. And this is, for instance, essentially the idea behind like ABCD method. But some other works, like for instance, DMC's work, they chose each coordinate with the wrong probability distribution proportional to the L high. But if, if you ask them, actually I asked, we all come from MIT, but they said that this turned out to be the tightest distribution for their analysis, which is closer to Nestor's original analysis to coordinate them. And this is, I think, a benefit of using linear coupling framework, which is a more powerful like, framework that allows you to have more freedom at different places. And in particular here, it get, becomes really a very natural choice to choose the probabilities to be proportional to the square root. And that's how we obtain this result. And uh, that was the theoretical part. And we have some empirical <coughs> things. For instance, on ERM problems, we tried, uh, we tried some real life data sets with different feature vector norms. And we indeed improved the prior work. And in matrix uh, inversion, we also improved prior work. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's the summary of the first part, the summary of the second part, the summary of the third part.